Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. This is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week I have this great privilege that EWTN has granted to me uh, to introduce to you men and women who have been brought home to the Catholic Church. If you watch the program over a period of time, you know that the Holy Spirit uses all different ways to open our hearts and our minds, sometimes a, gently, a gentle nudge, sometimes a bowling ball, whatever it is to get our attention. And over the years, I will say that uh, you, your letters and emails have uh, not only affirmed that this program has been an encouragement to you, but you've also let us know that certain guests who come from certain backgrounds are always a particular interest to you, possibly because you have certain people knocking on your door and you're wondering how do we answer them. So uh, tonight is one of those programs. Our guest tonight is Barry Metzentine. He's a former Mormon. Uh, how would you say, former nothing, former Mormon, former nothing, and now Catholic, and he's also an active server uh, of, of the faith in the church, and so it's a great privilege to welcome you, Barry, to the, you. Uh, the Journey Home program. It's good to have you here. It's an honor and a privilege. As I mentioned to the audience, always good to have a former Mormon talk about the journey on, on the church, to the church, but before we get into the start of your story, just to begin by letting the audience know what you're doing now that you're a Catholic. Sure, I have the honor and privilege of working for the Catholic Church in a parish, uh, Our Lady of Fatima, Lakewood, Colorado. I work with the youth and the adult ministry. Um, there's a variety of opportunities sure. there from high school. As I say, I, I work with 15 years to 115 or beyond if necessary. <laughs> um, just in sharing. All still young though, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> sharing and, and helping to form folks in the faith. It's a All real right. privilege. Oh, well, it is a great privilege mm -hmm. that you're doing that. And we, later in the program, might talk about some of the unique challenges of working with that wide age group, you mm -hmm. know, especially if you're trying to do it all at the same time. No? No, you really <laughs> got to have lots of help. Lots yeah, of help. That's right. All right. Um, so. What we normally do in a journey home is I get out of the way as soon as possible <clears throat> and invite you to go all the way back to the beginning and uh, give us a glimpse of your the beginning mm -hmm. of your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can do that. Um, I think it's to start by saying, I grew up a pretty uh, ordinary life, but uh, unchurched mm -hmm. in, in all regards. I mean, the times that I went to church growing up in my youth was less than 10, probably wow. five or six times. Your, maybe. your parents weren't uh, members anywhere? Or no, not they formally. They just drifted themselves? Really, yeah. There was a sense of, of God and in, in a sense of Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. Christmas was Jesus' birthday. And, and I remember a couple times, actually, my mother trying to bring scripture into the house, mm -hmm. um, but really to no avail. So largely just unformed, unchurched, yeah. uh, general sense, uh, you know, if you were to ask me, are you a Christian? I'd say yes, but did I really understand that? No. So more of a culture, um, yeah, cultural thing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But, but uh, yeah, pretty ordinary uh, life. Prayer wasn't a part of your life. No, no, no. I, I had not experienced prayer actually until after high school and I was okay. in the military, U.S. Air Force. And that's when I met my encounter with the Mormon Church, actually. Okay. Even before that, just ask, like, did, if you thought about the big questions when you were a young man, did, was God in the equation at all? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, actually coming to mind now. When I was very young, I did have a sense of God in a pretty profound way. And I'm talking seven, eight years old, mm -hmm. young, um, to the point there was, I remember now, there was a couple of years where... I had uh, some pretty fantastic dreams um, and, and saw God actually in heaven wow. uh, and that I heard my name spoken a few times to the point I remember, and my mom still remembers this, I'd run downstairs and say, did you call me? <laughs> say, oh no, no, no. Uh, my grandmother, my mom's mother was uh, um, in tune with that aspect of my life and, and actually talked to me about that. But other than that, I have to say yeah. it was pretty minimal, uh, again, just a general, I believe right. in God, sure, yeah. but not really knowing and understanding who. But do you is. look back on those early visitations as, uh, as, as the Lord trying to get your attention, at least planting a seed in your Oh, mind? absolutely. Yeah. I think because of that, I did have that sense that yeah. there is a God. Um, and now that you, you bring it forward, I, I, yes, that was significant in that it did provide some grounding, some sense mm -hmm. of, of meaning and purpose. Uh, as so I was growing up. A little touch of the mercy of God early Absolutely. on. Uh, Absolutely. Did, uh, before I get you into the Mormon church, uh, one other question, did that l little sense of God have effect on your moral life, your ethical life, anything until the Mormon church? Or 
Uh, to some degree, I mean, I, I knew the basics of, of morality to the point, you know, you shouldn't um, do these things. Um, but it didn't really affect me too greatly. I was a decent child growing up, <laughs> but I had my, my moments. Right. Like so, we all did, right? Yeah. Was um, the Catholic Church at all in that early day? Did you no. Well, know? actually, yes, now that, you, now that you bring that up. In high school, I had the, uh, well, in junior high school, I was going off the deep end, and I think my parents knew that. And so they, <laughs> they uh, moved quite suddenly out of the Portland, Oregon area, where I grew right. up, to Central Oregon which is um, very much like this area, rural, um, as I saw it was Hickville, USA at the time, but it was the greatest thing they did because it took me away from a life that at that point was, was leading me to drugs and gangs and just not a, not a good place to go. And now I'm out in the middle of nowhere. And um, in that, I actually hooked up and met um, some Catholic folks. I did not know or have a comprehension of what that meant, but they were just some good kids. Yeah. and um, actually had an opportunity to straighten my life out, got into sports, played football, wrestling, uh, track, tried basketball, but, but uh, <laughs> too, many, too many fouls, so I had to go back to football. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was a group of, of, of kids that, that were Catholic. As I look back now, I realize mm -hmm. that. I didn't, wasn't overtly aware of that, but they would invite me over, and I would actually participate in kind of an underground life teen, if you will, where they'd play music and they'd sing and then they'd pray. Um, and that was pretty interesting to me. I was yeah. drawn to it, but I was still, you know, yeah. not really present to it. So there was that, there was that encounter, I it think. It really is good when we look back and see the different ways that the Lord touched our life, you know, mm -hmm. just little seeds and little taps. Yeah, that's true. That that's true. later come to fruition in His timing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Mormon life came into you, right? It did. How did that happen? It did. Well, out, like I said, out, out of high school, I went into the U.S. Air Force, and I'd been in the service two years, pretty much keeping to myself, and I went to uh, reach out to a friend of mine from high school who lived in Utah, and ended up driving up there. I was stationed in New Mexico, and met her, did not know she was Mormon, and met her friend, her roommate, who was also Mormon, and we struck up, her friend and I struck up a relationship that uh, continued, we continued to dialogue long distance. And what struck me was very early in the relationship telling me, well, I'm Mormon and that's very significant to me and you're not and while I have feelings for you, this is kind of an issue. And I was like, that caught my attention. <laughs> I'd never before had anybody presented something of, of such passion to me about that the faith. Yeah. Yeah. And so, driven in relationship as a young man. Um, I said, all right, I'll check this out. And so I had a lovely couple, actually more, most people know Mormon missionaries as the young men or women that come to their door. Right. I was blessed with this older couple. They were in their 70s and they were on a mission. Okay. And um, you know, I'm away from home and I'm coming to their, their little humble home in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Yeah. And I went through the teachings and I was struck. I was like, this sounds great. This mm -hmm. is a great story. It makes sense to me um, <laughs> because they start the story with, and we'll come back to this, I hope, um, with three questions that really caught my attention. Mm -hmm. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Yep, the big philosophical. Exactly. Right, right. And, and they frame their whole faith around answering those mm -hmm. universal questions. And I was drawn into it. And having no real understanding of God or, or the nature of Christianity. It was just very attractive, very attractive. So with that relationship with, my, with uh, my Mormon missionaries, with my relationship with who became my first wife, and her family also who embraced me, um, I was swept in and it just really was a great experience for me to have a sense of identity, to have a sense of, wow, I understand these questions that, that are in our hearts uh, but now I understand it in a way that has context and meaning. So it was very powerful for me to come into that experience at the time. I, I've often heard at least the accusation that Mormons sometimes use evangelistic dating. <laughs> yes, I think um, <laughs> there's probably some truth to that, but it was not the intention of this young lady at that point. I, right. I mean, we met, uh, we were attracted to each other as young men and women are, and because of her passion of the faith, it was important to her. But I'm, 
I, I know that yeah. this wasn't the reason, yeah. if you will, but it does yeah. happen. Um, and frankly, particularly with the young adults, um, the faith is very attractive. They have a lot of energy, a lot of passion. Yeah. Uh, they right live at the it. time they're ans ans asking those big questions. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, it does happen. Yeah. I'm aware of that, yeah. and I'm also aware of that. Well, and even if that wasn't her goal, on the one hand, it didn't stop her. Her commitment to Mormonism didn't stop her from, from yeah. dating a Gentile. Exactly. Yeah. She just said right up in front, you know, if we're going to continue this dating, you know where I'm coming from. So right up front, that's what yeah. she says, right? Uh, within the first uh, week, yes. Okay, there it is. Okay. <laughs> right up front. So you got married. We did. I, I was married in the Mormon church. Prior to that, though, I went through the, their lessons. It's an eight-week lessons, um, and they do a brilliant job of presenting the faith. And I was baptized, um, and I came in the with, name of the in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Full immersion, All right. um, which they understand to be the only valid form of baptism. Okay. And then I lived for a year as a Mormon, married civilly, well, married in a church, but not ultimately sealed, which is deep in the, in yeah. the core of their faith, is the purpose of marriage is man and woman come together. They're sealed, mm -hmm. in their words, for all time and eternity. And this happens in their temples. And I experienced that a year after, of course, being in the faith and demonstrating living a life of uh, fidelity. Okay. Um, and then came and had that experience. And then we were continued to be married. We had a child, my daughter, who's 26 now. And, um, but as life would have it, the marriage came to an end uh, four and a half years mm -hmm. down the road after I uh, exited the Air Force. And um, yeah, it, you never... There's never anything good about separation, but right. but um, at that point, then my relationship with the church shortly thereafter was severed um, through my own um, your own decision, my own decisions. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Had in those five years, though, had the, the faith become yours? Had you know, had you really mm -hmm. adapt adopted the Mormon faith during those years of your marriage, or fully? I fully embraced it. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm a pretty passionate person, <laughs> and and. Um, I felt this is it. The story is very compelling. They, we have the truth. Everyone else is wrong. That's very compelling from a religious sure. standpoint. And our goal is we are evangelizing to come out and, and bring the restored gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, a world that has been in a state of darkness for nearly 1,800 years. Because um, you believe basically it was, immediately it was lost after Jesus. Very soon thereafter, at the death of the last apostle, um, and by certainly the Council of uh, Ephesus, or Council of Nicaea, excuse me, right. it was completely corrupt. And the priesthood, which is very important, mm -hmm. was removed from the earth, and the church then fell into complete apostasy. They call it the Great Apostasy. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the grounds then for the need to bring back the restored gospel of Jesus Christ to the world that had been living in darkness for so long. Yeah, it's right. very powerful, and so in that, I served the church in a variety of roles, was very committed, and experienced you know, some very powerful experiences as community, um, as just living the, the family-centered life, and of helping and serving others. There's, there's, there's great merit mm -hmm. in that, and I want to emphasize that. There's, yeah. there's a lot of good here, um, mm -hmm. good people doing good things, um, but unfortunately, you know, the theology and the yeah, the the yeah. reason for it is is flawed. Had you, they have a slightly different view of the Trinity and, and the divinity and humanity of Christ, right? And even of the Father, mm -hmm. and our relationship. Had you was that clear up in front? Crystal you, clear. Okay. Uh, and it isn't always with all Mormons, right. but but again, because of my enthusiasm, I studied. I read the Doctrine and Covenants. I read the Book of Mormon. I read the Bible, and I completely brought it into my life. And I would, you know, the, and and you have to begin with the Trinity and. First off, they don't see it as a trinity as we do. It's actually quite different. Um, they see it as three persons. They call it the personhood. Mm -hmm. They see God the Father um, as actually having flesh and, and uh, being a glorified being. They see the Son, Jesus Christ, as a spiritual elder brother to all of us who took on the atonement, if you will, and then was assumed into the Godhood as a second person. And then they have the Holy Ghost, which they see and understand as spirit that binds them in purpose and unity. Mm -hmm. But definitely three distinct beings, uh, three different persons, not one nature of three persons, but three 
Uh, and Satan right. is the rebellious brother? He is. Lucifer is the rebellious brother, and they believe in pre-existence life where we all were present mm -hmm. as spiritual children, and there was mm -hmm. this battle, this, and Lucifer, of course, was cast out, and Jesus, our elder brother, stepped up, and God, knowing that we would need atonement, said, I will, I will um, take this role on, and in doing so in his faithfulness, um, mm -hmm. we then look to Jesus Christ to find our uh, necessary atonement in that, and that we too then can be assumed and become glorified beings um, to propagate, if you will, this plan of salvation that our Heavenly Father has given us. Is the, the idea that uh, as a Mormon, once you die, if you're a faithful Mormon, you will essentially become a god of your own plan or the universe, is that? Yes, that's the ultimate desti destiny. Uh, that requires a ceiling here on earth for all time and eternity between man and woman. So you, you and your wife would have mm -hmm. been the new God and goddess of that? Absolutely, of, that, of that's whatever. the ultimate uh, journey and the belief of what this progresses to. Uh, they also do believe though in degrees of heaven and, and uh, the highest being what we're talking about, the celestial kingdom okay. of where men and women sealed become God, goddesses of their own world so that they then can replicate uh, spiritual children and then offer them the choice to participate in this path of glorification, of deification um, in that mm -hmm. sense. But they have lesser degrees of heaven and, and uh, there is, as that's been explained and, and further modified <laughs> in recent history, um, some faithful Catholics even would, would have an opportunity to, to experience a degree of heaven, but not to the greatest extent. Not the greatest extent. Yes. And uh, what was the other question? Oh, it always cracks me up that all the, all, all the, the, the most successful and most profitable uh, day planner, day timer programs are always kind of run by the Mormons' mm -hmm. connections. And I wondered if that's a little bit of Mormon theology coming down into organizing life and being very disciplined because you're preparing yourself sure, 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 for sure. the long term. That's absolutely correct. Very orderly, very organized. And it does, it's very attractive to the orderly in society. Um, there's a lot of professionals yeah. that are attracted to this. It, it's clean, it's systematic, it has all the answers from the beginning to the end, and this is how it's accomplished. So it's, it's very much in that sense. Um, also, though, in recent times, there's been a lot of their missionary work has been to third world countries, mm -hmm. and what they're doing there is they're bringing, you know, uh, and, and coming to the needs of the poor, um, and people are coming into the faith because of the sense of they're taking care of us, they're building community mm -hmm. around that. Um, so I don't want to think that it's just the professionals, right. but right. yes, there is very much a sense of orderliness, um, and it's a very attractive to those that like order. Yeah, it's a right. very attractive option. So you were into this hook, line, and sinker. Oh yes. But then when your marriage falls apart, you just drop it. <sighs> well, not immediately. Okay. Uh, there was, um, you know, outreach they, they that they gave, and they did not want to see me leave, but. In the course of that separation, there were, of course, in my side, um, improprieties in my life that, that I felt bad about and I was doing things that I knew I should not be doing. And so I went to, they have a form of confession. It's not where you go to their bishop, who is the ward over a community, a ward, they call it, yeah. kind of like a parish. And so I remember going to a bishop and having this very private conversation about some sins that I was struggling with and I remember then the responses I was getting were confusing to me because they asked me point blank he says is this a sister or is this a Gentile and I looked at him <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself I didn't say anything I'm like, does that matter <laughs> um, and that was when I started to and then there were some other things that happened in conversations that I started to see and understand the human factor behind mm -hmm. um, the church and and just in doubting and when that first seeds of doubt started to happen then it just cascaded over me mm -hmm. and I came to a realization and this was very shattering in my life um, where I said oh my gosh this is not it isn't true and I had I, it just crushed me and at that point I felt so betrayed because my whole life I had never really had anything, and now I've got this beautiful, systematic, it's all laid out. I'm very much uh, embracing it, and then I come to find out that it's, it's not true. 
is there something not right here? And I remember making the decision. I, I didn't stop believing in God, but I, I said verbally, I, I'm done, I'm through. I've been betrayed. I don't need you, God. And I just transitioned my life at that point to where, as I tell my friends, I fully embraced the secular world, um, entered into a decade of darkness, <laughs> and did everything that the world told me to do. You know, I went after my education, my career, my successes, um, and I burned a lot of relationships in the process of that. It's not a very proud time, um, but that's where it led me because I was so betrayed, yeah. and I just said, enough, I can't, I can't deal with this. Um, so that, that's where it You know, it, I, I've heard this in a variety of people, people who um, get very into end times thinking, you know, and where they mm -hmm. think, you know, it's, it's the end of the world, it's going to happen next month, or mm -hmm. maybe even the Catholics who get very much into certain apparitions that, that pr predict that it's going to happen in two months, or, you know, and so their lives can be very dedicated and committed to that, but when it comes and passes and doesn't happen, mm -hmm. Not only do they just say, okay, I was wrong in that, but they start doubting everything because right. am I going to invest myself into something else and get hurt again? Exactly. exactly. And so you, for 10 years, you're not going to invest yourself in anything because you were so blindsided. I mean, that's... That's exactly right. I invested myself in myself, and I became very self-centered and selfish and, you know, motivated to, to say, all right, I'm going to make my life happen as... Um, the world is telling me it needs to happen, yeah. and I'm going to take advantage of that. And I don't have, I don't want anything to do with God. Um, I was very, wow. very overt about that. You're, the Lord had touched you earlier on as a mm -hmm. child, a couple little things, yeah. you know. And then you're going into Mormonism, and then now you go through this ten years of darkness. Did the Lord touch you at all during those ten years? Was there anything in there? You know, if you look back, and yeah, I was pretty gone, but um, <laughs> <laughs> there were. And th this is something when I, in my current role, when I talk with people coming into the faith, yeah. I can acknowledge, you know, you never ultimately are not aware. And I don't believe that. I don't believe in true atheism. Mm -hmm. I believe that there is always something deep down. It may be shrouded. It may be, you know, you put a, you put a brick a wall around it. But there's something inside of us that tells us, uh, um, this isn't right. Um, I'm doing things that I really shouldn't <laughs> be doing. But... So I had some of that, but I was, I was pretty gone. And then at some point, you know, I, I, you make the switch and you realize, all right, even if he does exist, I'm, I'm so long gone that there's no chance. Uh, you know, it's that whole prodigal son yeah. uh, syndrome. There's just no chance that there's any path to return um, from this. So you just keep going. And that's when you start sp experiencing, okay, I've experienced everything of the flesh and of the world. I come up empty, of course, and now instead of, now you're feeling well, but I'm so far gone. There's no hope. So now you enter the period of your life where it's it's just anxious and restless and not satisfied. And that's kind of where I was when I met my current wife of 12 years. Um, she met me as I was coming out of those dark years, but still in a very much a state of hmm. of restlessness and and anxiety and, and the whole affair. So yeah, you get caught up in the the voices of the world, the flesh, and the mm -hmm. devil during the dark years, and it's hard to tell, you know, uh, yeah, or yeah. listen anymore and to discern, is that a good thing for me, or is that mm -hmm. my own self speaking out when really it might be the evil one trying mm -hmm. to just pull you deeper in, into the darkness. Mm -hmm. So did you start to come out of it before you met your present wife? Did you, or no. Did, was she the spark? I think she was the spark. Okay. I was p still pretty fully embracing the, the world. Now, I, you know, I do have two older children, a 26-year-old daughter, which I mentioned from my first marriage, and I have a 19-year-old son that um, was part of my journeys okay. during this time. And another decision I had made that, that, and I want people, particularly fathers, to know this, um, I made some decisions that I just were horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I separated myself from my children for years. And my daughter, I did not see from the time she was four until she was um, well, sixteen. Wow! And that 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 that's yeah. that's hurtful. And my son, same thing. Um, he came, and I didn't acknowledge the situation, yeah. and I abandoned it. And I want fathers to know that this, you know, if you're in those situations as a father, um, yeah. uh, make the effort to reach out. Now, fortunately, through the graces of my conversion, I have relationships with both of my children now. But I realize, looking back, just how much of a wound 
uh, mm -hmm. that is, the father wound particularly, that is inflicted on the children through this. And During that time, did you not want to see them, or you just kept pushing it down, pushing it back? I kept pushing it down. Well, yeah, I, I, I pushed it down because in the early separation time, I felt that they were using my daughter as kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, saying, oh, you know, she's praying for your soul, and I'm just like, she's two and a half years old. She can't be <laughs> praying for my soul. Um, <laughs> but there were some things that happened, and, and I selfishly and inappropriately made decision. I said, you know what, it's best just to cut the ties because I don't want her to be. Hmm. But then in doing that, wow. you know, it wounded me, and then I'm just become the walking wounded in my life because mm -hmm. of it. It um, wasn't good. And, but again, thanks to the graces of God, those relationships are back in my life, have been for several years now, and, and I'm just delighted to have that. Uh, back in my life and appreciating it. But that wasn't until after you started coming out of the dark period, right? That's right. That's okay. right. I met uh, my, my current wife in 1993. Yeah. Um, and we had a five year uh, off and on relationship, and her amount of her patience and, and grace with me was inspiring, to say the least. <laughs> I, I have no idea what kept her compelled to, to keep us in relationship. Um, I, of course, now see it because she was really a gateway for mm -hmm. me into the faith and unassuming as she was about it. But I have to say this. I remember we had been dating for about six months, and I asked her, I said, so you're Catholic? And she's like, oh, yeah. You know. And I knew this. And, and, <laughs> and I go, so you go to church every Sunday? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and she went some, did something on Wednesday nights. And I go, really? And I said, well, what are, you, you know, what are you doing there? You know? And I'll never forget her response. And she doesn't remember it, but it was <laughs> profound. She said, I go and I commune with Jesus Christ. And I was like, I remember to this day when she said that, blew me away. Well, that I've never heard anybody say anything like that. That was over the top. <laughs> Why don't we pause there? It's a good place to break. We'll, we'll come back in a moment. You can tell us really how the Lord used those five years to, to bring you home. All right? Sounds so, good. Okay, Thank I'll you. I'll be back in a little bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest this evening is Barry Metzentin, and former Mormon. And you've, you've given us your Mormon phase, a uh, very committed Mormon, well-informed Mormon. Uh, and then about 10 years or so of darkness, uh, just completely, not just going back to where you were before, but really going back mm -hmm. and rejecting any outreach. And then you meet a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And you dated her five years well, until you got married, right? That's right. Did you, were you, were you full-fledged in the church after those five years of, of dating? No, 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 no. That's the interesting part. Um, I came into the Catholic Church and a Catholic marriage. I was not uh, Catholic at that time. In fact, I had to go through the annulment process as a non-Catholic, mm -hmm. which was an interesting experience. Um, mm -hmm. And with that then was able to, my wife was able to have a full Catholic uh, marriage, a mass. Right. And I remember uh, when that marriage, when that mass, the whole experience for me was um, very mystical. Mm. I was like, this is pretty different <laughs> than, than the first time around. And it was significant and meaningful to me. But for the first seven years of our marriage, I continued to live as a non, wow. non anything. Did you go to mass with your wife at all? Uh, initially, not a lot. But then as the years wore on, I started going uh, more and more to the point where when we got married, we moved from Green Bay to Denver, Colorado. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I want to share this with her in the best way that I can, which at the time I was thinking, I, I'm not sure as a non-Catholic, what can you do in the church? Sure. So we actually went and found a parish, and uh, within a year we found some great ministries, small faith sharing group ministries, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden now I'm with my wife, we're meeting with other Catholics. Next thing I know, I'm being asked to be part of that ministry core team uh, to represent the non-Catholic uh, perspective. <laughs> then another year later, the pastor asked me, he says, Barry, Father Ken Leone, God bless him, 
he said, Barry, he said, you need to start up a mixed faith couples ministry. And, and so then my wife and I started a mixed faith couples ministry. Again, I being the non-Catholic in this. And then a year after that, Father Ken... Before you uh, go there. Oh, sure. Are they, have they given <laughs> up on you considering the faith or are they just assuming in time? You know, that's a great question. And I think um, there was never really any overt, you need to become Catholic. It was more of an embracing and just letting me be yeah. as I was. I never felt any pressure whatsoever okay. Okay. Uh, from the priest or from the folks I was working with on staff. And um, anyway, then the next thing I know, he's asking me to be on the parish council. And I'm like, Father Ken, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> oh, that's okay. We need a non-Catholic perspective. And so I'm, I serve on a parish council and a mixed faith ministry and small faith sharing <laughs> ministry core teams as a non-Catholic. Um, and that was all of this, of course, is bringing me in sure. to be embraced and to, and to be comfortable. And at this point, now, I am attending Mass pretty regularly. Um, and it was in that, during that time, that uh, on my business side, things were happening that enabled me uh, to become more present to God in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, God finds those moments. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was a massive business failure wow. <laughs> the attempt that I failed at and therefore found myself sitting idle, <laughs> pondering <laughs> what had just happened. <laughs> and at the same time, I'm growing more curious about the faith. And I enrolled in Catholic Biblical School, which is a four-year Catholic Bible study program out of Denver's phenomenal mm -hmm. program. At the time, uh, Dr. Tim Gray was, had started that, he was leading it, and he was actually teaching my class. And Tim and I, Tim took a liking to me, and, and we started <laughs> talking, um, and he knew I wasn't Catholic, and so we had a, a, a relationship there. Anyway, into the second year of Catholic Biblical School, I'm now thinking about, this is looking pretty good. Um, and I wanted to, I'm still now working part-time. God is enabling me in my failure to be present to, <laughs> and now all of a sudden people and events, he's just hurling at me. Because the, the thing that was important to me, and God knew this, and he knows what's important to all of us, because I was so convicted of the truth of the Mormon church, um, he knew I needed to have an even more conviction of the truth mm -hmm. of the Catholic church. And so in my seeking, first for the Catholic Biblical School, and then I started pursuing, um, through Catholic Distance University, I started taking online courses. I took a catechism course, and, I, and I, I'll never forget that. I, I went through the catechism. I, this is the most fantastic piece of literature I've ever read in my life. Uh, so, you know, the truth, the content is, for me, it was drawing me in deeper and deeper because it was so important. It's like, I, I need to know. Uh, not just in faith. I need to know all the ins and outs of, of this faith. And so God was providing. He gave me Catholic Biblical School. He gave me some classes on the catechism. And then in the midst of this, uh, Tim calls me up and says, hey, remember that graduate program I was telling you about? Well, we're starting it up. And I want you to, I want you to sign up. And I'm like, Tim, I'm not Catholic. He goes, that's okay. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> and so... My first so even at this point, they're still not pushing you. And you say, wait a second, you've got to come into the church. No, they're still no. just kind of letting you Let follow the Spirit. Be on the journey I was on. Um, <laughs> or maybe you appeared as such a stone wall, they just said, well, you know, he's not quite ready yet. Or, yeah. Well, no, you know, I think there were, there were some proddings along the way. But what was happening was also some, some necessary healing. Okay. And if I go back a couple years, uh, at the beginning of this, when I was getting into the ministry aspect of the Catholic Church, uh, mm -hmm. the person that... And, uh, that was heading this ministry of small communities, Nancy Parks, uh, was a great gift. I mean, she opened up for me my path that I needed for healing. Mm. And yeah, this was good four years before I came into the church, I had a mystical encounter. Um, and that mystical encounter was something I needed. And it was with God the Father, mm. because I was so wounded as a man and as a father. Mm. And I've never known my true father. Mm. I was horrible in my early years with my two eldest children mm. and and I didn't know how bad it was but I had a mystical encounter with God the Father and I experienced it was it was an amazing experience because in an instant I realized how wounded I am but mm. at the same time I experienced true fatherhood and it healed me mm. and at that point going forward I now have in that sense of this is what it means to be a father my son mm. um, and now I'm able to take that, and it was with that I was able to begin reaching out to my children from previous uh, years, and uh, yeah, incredible healing moment, 
that opened me up then to coming into further experiencing through ministry. Mm. Then I started experiencing small group settings, the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And sitting in small groups as this non-Catholic, leading Catholics in small faith sharing, and all of a sudden just feeling the Holy Spirit as a wave come rushing in and out and around the room. I'm like, what is going on here? This is fantastic. <laughs> I've never had this feeling before. Um, and it was the Holy Spirit. And realizing it had nothing to do with me. I was just this channel uh, that happened to, to feel the effects of it as it came rushing into the moment. Um, and so that was, that was incredibly powerful for me. But through that, I ultimately still was struggling with my relationship with Jesus Christ. Hmm. And I never really, in all the studies, Catholic Biblical School, the Augustine Institute, and all the great theology and everything I was receiving, I still wasn't able to, I hadn't had an encounter with Jesus Christ. God the Father, got it. Holy Spirit, got it. Then, then it happened. And it didn't happen until, uh, of course, when it needed to. So I'm in RCIA. At the same time, I'm in my last four years of Catholic Biblical School, I'm in my first year of Augustine Institute, and I'm in RCIA. This was a powerful year. <laughs> and uh, I came into the church at, um, in our, uh, through Easter Vigil. I was a catechumen because now the church had determined that the baptism wasn't valid. Mm -hmm. right. And I encountered Jesus Christ at, at Easter Vigil, and it nearly killed me. Huh. Um, and th the puzzle was now complete. I had now experienced... It nearly killed you. It did. It did. I mean, <laughs> I'm coming down. I, I was baptized. It was great. At the time, I had my three-week-old son, Joshua. We were both baptized at the same time. Fantastic oh. experience. I was confirmed. I'm like, this is great. This is wonderful. And I'm on my knees, and I had the audacity to say, I want more. <laughs> I need more. I need to know you. And I'll never forget, uh, you know, the voice that came, and he said simply, as he always does, I'll meet you in the Eucharist. Hmm. And it was an incredible experience, one that it's one of those, I need nothing else in my life. This is it. I'm done. Um, <laughs> as I'm walking down, I'll never forget it. My wife on one side, my sponsor on the other. I'm walking down to receive the Eucharist. And each step I'm taking, I'm becoming more and more aware as I'm walking into uh, the presence of Jesus Christ. And, and in an instant, I had another mystical encounter, and I realized in this instant, uh, I had a complete understanding of who he is. First, he's God. He's omnipotent. Um, and second, there is this incredible respect and dignity that God has in our human nature because he holds it in him perfectly. Um, and at the same time, realizing how broken we are in our nature, just so how broken we are in our nature, but yet God holds that up in such a... Uh, a dignified way. Truly, God sees our human nature in, in its perfection as he holds it there for us. Mm -hmm. So having that encounter, I was on the floor, I crumpled down, I screamed out. There's a thousand people, I scream out, I am not worthy. I couldn't do it, I just broke down. So I'm a puddled heap on the floor, and my wife and my sponsor are trying to pick me up, and the priest, God bless them, he takes the host and he just does the body of Christ and puts it in my mouth. And I'm on my knees at this point, receiving Christ into me. And I was physically aware as it came in, as he came in, just the waves that came through my whole body and permeated me. And I was like, oh my goodness gracious. And then I had the whole thing repeat with the, with the blood of Christ. So I had my mystical encounter with Jesus Christ. And now for me, my understanding of the Trinity was complete. And the blessings are unbelievable uh, in what that has given me. And uh, yeah, it's changed me forever. And here I am. You were, you were blessed with a sensual experience of the Trinity that yeah. most folk aren't. You know, and, and that doesn't take away from the validity of other people's experience because that wasn't a part of it. And that's mm -hmm. the thing we want to make sure the audience sure. doesn't want to take away from this. Yeah. But, it, but yet, maybe as you look back, why do you think the Lord discerned in his mm. wisdom that you needed this. Mm -hmm. I think because of my indoctrination into the Mormon faith and my understanding yeah. of who God was, I, that really needed to be rewritten <laughs> yeah. uh, at the core. Because even after that... It's like reformatting a hard drive. Exactly, I mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what you needed. Uh, because the Mormon faith, and I realized it as I was, as I was in my advanced studies at Augustine Institute, 
how much of that was still seeping in. Hmm. I remember... It makes sense that that took you so long to understand yeah, Jesus. Yeah. You still had those categories in your I mind did. from before. I did. And I think that's a big part of it. I think the uh, God the Father part was necessary because of my brokenness and my fatherhood. Hmm. The Holy Spirit was just showing me how the Spirit is permeating everything, and that's hmm. how God's working with the church through the Holy Spirit. I mean, Mm-hmm. He is there always. And then finally with Jesus Christ, that, that was necessary because I was not making the connection that He's God. <laughs> he mm-hmm. is God. But yet, He holds in Him our humanity and perfection and the dignity and the respect that He has for us mm-hmm. and yet at the same time realizing how broken we are. Yeah, so it, yeah, I like that. It was a reset, a reboot uh, <laughs> to get that hard drive uh, cleaned out and start afresh and now we can build up from that. Um, yeah, and it was important for me because I prayed, I prayed for two hours. I fasted for like 36 hours prior to Easter Vigil. The two hours prior to it, I was in prayer. I went and hid myself in a <laughs> closet and I was praying just desperately because God knew I need to know, I need to know, I need to know yeah. that this is right, that this is true, that this is really where it's at. And as he always does, he delivered in spades. Um, he knows you. Yeah better than you knew yourself and what you needed and uh, mm-hmm. how that would work Absolutely. to actually bring to fruition those little taps of grace that you had experienced mm-hmm. way back when, you know, that were still yeah. there. I've got an email. Let me take this because this uh, Chad from Maine writes, I have a Mormon co-worker who is a wonderful person and, and we're good friends. Occasionally <coughs> the subject of religion comes up and I would like to know how best to share with her the good news of the Catholic Church without alienating her or destroying our friendship. Does Barry have any suggestions? Thank you, Chad, for that. That's a fantastic question. I'm glad it was asked because I talk to Catholics all the time, how to dialogue with Mormons. Uh, and there's two different. There's the relationship here and then there's the missionaries. But this being in a co-worker, the first thing I would say is don't be afraid to just be yourself and to acknowledge uh, that there are things in the Mormon faith that we really can dialogue, particularly as it relates to community, to the importance of family, the importance of living a moral life, uh, and to not be afraid to say, "Yeah, you know, we we agree. This is these are these are beautiful teachings of the faith." Um, and then the other thing is, is not to be afraid to share what the Catholic faith means to you, because a personal testimony mm-hmm. is the is the end of all ends for every Mormon. In in catechism mm-hmm. classes, they are taught this is how you give a personal testimony, and it has these factions to it. Um, so for them to hear someone else give a personal testimony of your faith and your experience in the sacraments, your experience in, in the church and seeing and understanding it to be the authority of Christ uh, being manifested through the generations from the apostles themselves and that you've encountered Jesus Christ, you've experienced the Holy Spirit, but also to acknowledge the beauty of, of what we do share and understanding the importance of community, families, families and the moral life. Uh, and just being honest and, and go there and, and meet there. And many Mormons believe, it's actually officially their doctrine, they, don't, they believe the Holy Spirit is not present to anybody outside mm-hmm. the Mormon church because we're all in a state of apostasy. Mm-hmm. And so when people share in the spirit of the Holy Spirit, that's impactful. They're like, whoa, you're a Catholic and you have a personal testimony of Jesus Christ in your life? This is amazing. Um, yeah, so I, I think that would be a great approach, and just to be authentic in that relationship. Um, yeah, absolutely. It encourages Catholics to, as Peter says in First Peter, have a, be able to give a reason for the hope that exactly. they have, exactly. and explain the difference that God has made in their life. Mm-hmm. We have another email which kind of addresses that very question. Jacob from Arizona. Seems like the average Joe in the pew doesn't have much desire or ability to share his faith with others. How can we get the ordinary Catholic to be on fire for the Catholic faith? Well, that's, that's my business these days. See, that's connected to what yes, you're doing. All this right. is what I do in the church, and it is a delight to, to uh, engage that every day I come to work. Um, it's actually not work, but can I come to the church? I think, particularly as converts, uh, we have the ability to bring a certain zeal and excitement that is attractive and to draw mm-hmm. Catholics in to help them understand the beauty and the splendor of the faith. As I, the, the one analogy I use with parents all the time is I say, you know, you're sitting on a treasure box, and in that treasure box is everything that man's heart desires in this world. It has mm-hmm. all the answers to the meaning of life. 
let's open that treasure box. You need to know that what you have and what you hold the world desperately needs to know. I'm a product of that, you know, mm -hmm. and I think back all the opportunities where I would have come into the faith potentially even sooner had more people come to me and said, Barry, check this out. Mm -hmm. This is really uh, some pretty fantastic stuff. It gets back to the same three questions. In the Catholic faith, we do have the answers to where we come from, why we're here, and where we're going. And God has a plan, and that plan has been there from the beginning, and we're participating in that plan, and it's being implemented and fulfilled in the church through the sacramental life. And that we're not just coming to attend, but we're actually partaking and, and participating in God's plan, and we are intimately part of His God's plan then as we go out and become that light, to become Christ to the world. So helping Catholics to see and understand the splendor of all that um, and to Appreciate bring what them. what they have so they can Absolutely. share it with enthusiasm. Absolutely. Another email. This is Tammy from the Midwest. I entered the Catholic Church about two years ago and I'm disheartened. Mm. She writes, my parish priest can't preach well, the choir is disappointing, <clears throat> and I can't seem to make any friends at my church. I'm tempted to simply go back to my evangelical church where I am at least I at least feel welcomed and spiritually uplifted. What should I do? Wow. Well, I, I you encounter that at all in your work? Uh, yes, I, there is that sense. Sometimes people don't feel welcome. They feel a bit alienated at the parish. And coming from my side, we're always wanting to strive that people do feel welcome. And I would encourage uh, this person to. To uh, you know, express these concerns with the priest or with the deacon or with the parish staff mm -hmm. um, there, and just to dialogue with them and reach out and say, "Here's how I'm feeling," and also in that, what can she do? It's a she, right? Yeah. Yeah. To uh, um, you know, maybe help in this arena because as Catholics, we have we're all accountable in in creating that welcoming environment. So if we're feeling alienated. You know, I would just encourage to reach out and to share this with people and to say, how can yeah. we help to, to change this? I remember uh, Jeff Cabins uh, wrote a book. I think it was called I'm Not Being Fed or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I forget the title of it, but he was addressing this question. And, and I'm not aiming this at the emailer, but, but part of our spiritual journey mm -hmm. is learning that the Mass isn't about me. Yes. You know, if, if, if the sermon's not touching me, the food isn't good afterwards, you know, the coffee and donuts and the fellowship isn't there, you know, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhere over. And, and part of what I would encourage them to do is to take a step back and say, wait a second, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. What is this Mass? Like you were saying, you meet Jesus in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Whether you got fellowship or not, the fellowship should spring from the Eucharist yes, as true. the center of it all. And so... Uh, you know, I think I remember one time Mother Angelica was asked a question like that. Someone was complaining about the Mass, and Mother Angelica, I, I, I can't quote her perfectly, but it was, it was something like, you know, she would close her eyes and pray. Mm -hmm. yeah, because she's not going to let the distractions take her away from what is really present, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. So, yes, absolutely. The importance of that. I'm wondering, um, you, you have such an intergenerational responsibility from age 12 to 112, you said. As you look at the different groups, my guess is that each group has barriers to reach mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. Teenagers, young adults, mm -hmm. young marrieds, you know, all the way up middle age. To, uh, any thought of today, which is the hardest age group from your experience to, to get excited about their faith, to recapture it, and the, or, or is it just everyone has their own different struggles? I think they all have their struggles. I think teens are generally, actually, contrary to popular easier to reach because mm -hmm. they are searching for something. And for them, identity is important uh, and feeling like they belong to something that's exciting, uh, which the faith is, and that it's actually meaningful and impactful in their life. So, uh, and, and then the generation I'm from, which uh, I think can be difficult because many are so assimilated into the culture. Mm -hmm. and they've been separated from the true sense of the faith. And the, the idea of being Catholic is a cultural thing, but it isn't, it isn't personal and it isn't meaningful in the day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. There's challenges there in breaking through to help people see and understand that the cultural influences 
uh, of which I come from, and I have no problem telling people, you know what, I fully embrace the secular world, and I'm telling you, you're going to come up empty, and I know you're already empty, uh, because God needs to permeate all of your life, not just when you're here at church. But then the seniors, which I have the honor of teaching a class, a Bible study to, the average age of 70, the thing that I think grieves them the most is their children, yeah. people my age, that have fallen away from the faith, and, and helping them to understand that uh, they're still parents, and as parents they have power and influence over their children, and yes, pray for them, but also engage them and share with them uh, you know, the feelings that you're having and invite them constantly uh, to come back and, and to engage the faith in a meaningful way because it's grievous, it's grievous on the heart uh, for them. So I've encountered a, a number of men, especially my dad's age and others who had been through war and mm. the, the, the memories, the hurts, the, the atrocity of war weighed on them so strongly that it, it mm -hmm. seemed to raise a huge barrier both to intimacy as well as the mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know you're involved with men's ministry, right? And yes. talk a bit about the importance of that and especially how you reach those men that just have huge walls around their heart. Thank you for that question. I, the men's ministry is vital and you know, much of what is going on in the church today as far as renewal necessary in the parish uh, comes from the men. And for a mm -hmm. generation or two, uh, the men have been generally absent. There's this statement or saying I read somewhere along the way that so many of us are raised at the skirts of our mothers, which is a good thing because it's nurturing, but yeah. the men have been absent in that leadership role. Mm -hmm. And we have a men's group at Fatima that I'm just so honored to be a part of. I go <laughs> just to be around these guys, uh, where we come every Saturday morning, we meet, and we're currently always looking at programs that can engage men in a real way, authentically engage a man exactly as they need to be, not, and, and as for men, that, that means challenging, that means intensity, uh, and, and being authentic in that. And we currently are using a program uh, from Houston, actually, from Paradisus Day, called That Man Is You. Fantastic program. I have seen and coming together Saturday mornings, uh, having a breakfast, having a video, and then small groups. And what's being presented is the faith and the challenge and the and and identifying for men. This is your responsibility, uh, and you're not owning up to it, and you haven't owned up to it for the last two or three generations. And until you do own up to it, the church is going to continue to struggle in its apathetic approach to our children and all the things that our children are facing in this world, you've got to be a man and step up and, and understand what it means to be a strong leader in the house with the faith because this is what your children need the most to equip them for uh, life and, and the secular world that we live in. And men are responding to that because it's aggressive, it's, it's, it's as men think, it's like, okay, there's a problem, here's how it's going to get solved, and I'm the answer. And, they're, and I'm seeing lives change in radical ways. It's, it's a great ministry. Well, we've only got a minute or so left. Let's say there's a just happens to be a Mormon watching this program. Hmm. What would you like to say to them? Why should they consider the Catholic Church? Well, I think, and I've had dialogues with many Mormons, uh, missionaries as well as uh, laity, and what I would say is what's at stake is the truth, and the truth is very important. I know it's important for uh, all people in the Mormon faith. This is why the Mormon Church exists and to open uh, our minds and our hearts to the possibility that there's a truth that exists that's fuller and that the great apostasy, which has been proposed as being the reason for the need for the restoration of the gospel, in fact didn't happen as it's understood and that this authority, this truth continues to exist and has from, from Jesus Christ to the apostles and handed down and to be open in the, to the possibility of that being the truth um, and coming, coming to see, coming to see um, perhaps there's more to the story than I understand. All right, Barry, thanks. If the folk want to get in touch with you or your work, is there a website or anything that you'd like to, at your church or something? Oh, sure. Okay. I, I'm open to emails, okay. actually. Uh, and my email address uh, is bmetzentine which is B-M-E-T-Z-E-N-T-I-N-E -E -E at FatimaLakewood.com. All right. So maybe we get some questions about some of the things you've talked about. I'd be delighted. Barry, thanks a lot. Thank you.
appreciate your witness and, and your sacrifice and, and what you're doing for all those different age groups. You've taken a lot on your shoulders, but you're helping the priests, right? I mean, that's Absolutely. as a lady, lay person, you're, you're, doing you're, you're, you're doing what you can in, in the work of the church. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope it was a, a strong encouragement to you to recognize how much God has given you. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you.